Welcome to day three of the 11th edition of the Sustainable Innovation Forum. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from in the world. It's lovely to have you with you with us. I'm Nick Gowing. I'm the founder and director of the Thinking the Unthinkable project. All week this week, we're asking, will the decisions we make um, make today's realign us with the uh, Paris Agreement and 2030 emission reduction targets. And we have two specific horizons here in our view. The next 12 months in the build up to COP26, which should have been happening now, but it'll happen a, a year from now in Glasgow. And the decisive action and convergence points that must be met over the next decade. Let me give you a personal view um, in the next 30 seconds of where we've got to the remarkable um, urgent expectations of next the next generation reflected in a session we had a few hours ago here. It started with a song which said, this is now an SOS from the kids. Uh, please change the story. I was struck by how remarkably well informed and literate on so many of these issues our guests were from the age of 14, 15 or 16. They'd put many adults to shame on this, I think. And we heard from companies as well one of whom, Vodafone, said, we're doing a lot, but we're still not doing enough on the climate emergency. And another, um, Lego, saying that um, they wanted to go out and give children their idea of how companies should change. But they've realized that the children often have far better ideas. Therefore, they're ch setting up a kind of children's board to actually input into the way that company is run. And education came up as a critical issue. Politicians needing to be educated, but above all, the educators need to be educated. They've got to change their view as well. So that spirit from the Youth Climate Summit was quite remarkable. And this from Greenpeace International. The circular economy alone will not be enough to, in their words, save us. So a sense of almost self-delusion that somehow everything's going to be fine, but actually it is not going to be. That determination of the next generation. Global warming, the next essential threat to humanity. We're going to pass the point of no return in the next eight to ten years. We don't have the point of time. Let me underline that fan of ambitions you saw at the end. This is about showcasing innovation. It's about building momentum. It's about raising ambition. It's about shaping policy. And it's about enabling partnership, getting more of you to talk to each other, to be aware of what each of you are doing and the key cutting edge issues we're all discussing. Now, we're halfway through our five days here at the Sustainable Innovation Forum. That means day three, the 18th of November. We've already talked about climate policy, finance and decision making. We talked about energy transition yesterday. Today we're talking about sustainable mobility and the youth agenda. Tomorrow, uh, Thursday, we'll be talking about the industry transition. We'll be joined by the uh, Director General of the International Energy Agency. And on Friday, land use and agriculture. We'll be joined as well by His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. But today, as you can see, is about sustainable mobility 
and the transport future. Now, to underscore that, how will pandemic life reshape the mobility we want, the mobility we expect, and the mobility, certainly, that we need? There are huge financial implications. Let me just give you this um, punctuation mark. EasyJet, the big um, um, low-cost airline, announcing only yesterday that having had a, a, a profit of 400 40 million pounds last year. This year, they've got a deficit of 1.2 billion. That is an enormous impact on investment in transport. How does an organization like that survive? And what kind of business will it end up being? Will it be the kind of business we will eventually need? What does the future of mobility look like? Mobility, including transport. What industries, what innovation, what infrastructure should we support and invest in, and how fast can that investment come? Now, immediately after this, there'll be a virtual panel on the future of transportation in these troubling times. I'll be joined as well um, in a live interview with Mighty for a Mighty announcement. They're the big logistics firm, um, one of the largest firms in the world, moving people around. They've got an enormous um, uh, announcement to make about how quickly, how quickly they believe they can now be net zero. Our chief sustainability officer uh, for, My for Mighty has actually come here in his electric vehicle to make that point, driven 140 miles, 140 kilometers to get here from the south of England, which gives him enough in his batteries to get back there uh, after the program. We'll have a break then, and then uh, we'll be talking to another climate leader live, the vice president for sustainability and mobility from the BMW Group, who will be joining me live from Munich. So please, Get your questions and thoughts into us as soon as possible for these live discussions. What kind of mobility model are they developing in all their factories and plants around the world? The big shift in mobility that they have to consider. And the final panel in the next three hours uh, is with our partner Slowcat, um, debating with city mayors joining us from North America and Europe, discussing the future of urban transport in our pandemic world. We can't yet say post-pandemic, sadly. This is going to be with us for some time to come. But first, this message from the president of the Marshall Islands and the ever-growing threats to the low-lying nations. But there are some positives despite COVID-19. Yahweh, it is easy to look at the climate crisis that we face today and despair for our future and the future of our children. It is inevitable that we feel fear as floods tear at one stable shores, as fires rip through family homes, and as the coronavirus its spread and it will through the destruction of wildlife and their habitats take so many of our loved ones from us. It is tempting to freeze in the face of disaster to keep carrying on as we have before, because change, no matter how necessary, is difficult. For those of us on the front line of the climate crisis, despair is not an option. Fear is not an option. Freezing is not an option. For our people, for our culture, for our future, we in the Pacific know that the only solution is action. Action that is fast, fair, and bold. We have never had a better opportunity to take such action. The world is undoubtedly in an unprecedented global crisis struck by a triple threat of COVID-19. Its economic impact and the climate emergency. Though my country has remained COVID-19 free by taking immediate action to close our borders, that isolation posed a great challenge to our economy, hindered our access to advanced healthcare, and separated many of our citizens from their loved ones for several long months. But we know that transformative change can arise from crisis, and even from devastating disease. The Renaissance in Europe emerged from the ashes of the Black Death, bringing forth a wave of creativity, innovation, and change. 
What will it take to unleash that today? To deliver a green recovery that not only gets us through the present emergency, but also sets on course for greater health, security, and sustainability. It will take commitment. Commitments came together in 2015 in Paris to make a vow for our planet's future, to keep global temperature rise within 1.5 degrees. A key part of that agreement is for countries to submit enhanced nationally determined contributions every five years. The second round of which are due by the end of 2020. We have submitted ours, Norway, Rwanda, and Chile. Fellow members of the High Ambition Coalitions have submitted theirs along with nine others. But 13 is not enough, and restating previous NDC commitments is not enough. The deadline is fast approaching, and I call on fellow leaders not to let it slip. Live up to your commitments and submit an ambitious in the hands in DC this year. The type of transformative change we need will also require us to adapt. Even if we stay within the 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature goal, which I believe we can and must, that temperature rise will affect millions. Here in my country, we are consulting with communities across our islands and atolls to understand our people's adaptation needs and develop a plan to secure a healthy and safe future. For us, this national adaptation plan is not just a plan to adapt, but also to survive. The change we seek will require support. The pandemic has made clear to us just how deeply connected we are. The recovery that we can set a course for today must be one that creates a more just and equitable world. We know we cannot implement our ambitious decarbonization and adaptation plans without the support of the international community. Finally, it will take innovation. As we recover from COVID-19, we have an opportunity to invest in more renewable energy and other new low zero carbon technologies to decarbonize our economies once and for all. With that, I welcome the opening of the Sustainable Innovation Forum today. I hope that it will contribute new and bold ideas and lead to the urgent action that we need to secure a safe and prosperous future for more data. One of the smallest nations in the world, they're urging bold and urgent action and solutions from this kind of process that you've all signed up to today, that we're part of at the Sustainable Innovation Forum. Now, let me introduce you to this clock. As some of you will have seen it in the last two days, but if you've just joined us, this is a clock marking seven years, uh, 43 days, and 22 hours. This clock represents the total amount of time we have remaining on current calculations at the current levels of carbon emissions before we were to reach irreversible climate tipping points. That too is a sobering figure, not least because that takes us to 2027, not to 2030, which tends to be in the minds of many for net zero, 2030, 2040, 2050. This is just 2027, a reminder of the urgency there.